Welcome everyone. Today we have the honor and the pleasure of speaking with one of my closest colleagues who I consider a brother and a friend um, who has been on this journey of peace with me, understanding how we can attend to and address suffering in our world and find meaning uh, in suffering, especially in times of crisis. Um, my, my dear colleague and friend and brother uh, is Reverend Dr. Sam Lowe. He is the chief chaplain at Boston Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, in New England. Boston Medical Center is the largest safety net hospital in New England. And we're going to have a conversation with Sam about spiritual care, spiritual care provision in the context of Boston Medical Center, and in the context of what we're wrestling with in the powers that be where Dr. Wink has been talking about the domination system, how we name it, unmask it, and eventually engage with it so that we can redeem fallen powers and engage with how that redemption process and that, that, that act of engaging with the fallen powers is nonviolent. So welcome, Sam, and I really appreciate you joining us today to talk about the work, the really hard work of spiritual care in America's safety net hospital systems. Um, Sam, could you just give us a sense of what, what is Boston Medical Center? What's the mission and vision of Boston Medical Center? Um, and just give us a, a sense of what populations Boston Medical Center serves. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Um, um, Boston Medical Center is, like you said, it's the largest uh, safety net hospital uh, in New England. It is also the um, the busiest, uh, ha it has the busiest uh, ER or emergency de department in, in all of New England. And um, many people in this area uh, know it as uh, Boston City Hospital. And so where, where, where Boston Medical Center is located is in the south end uh, of Boston. And, um, and for many years, it was known as Boston City Hospital and it was founded back in the 1800s, uh, one of the first public hospitals in, in the United States. And in 1996, uh, Boston City Hospital merged with Boston University Medical Center to form Boston Medical Center. And so in, in that merger, it, it, it ceased becoming um, a city hospital in the same way that uh, like Elmhurst General is in New York, it, in that it wasn't part of the city of Boston's budget. It became a private nonprofit hospital, but still with the designation of, of safety net hospital. Uh, safety net hospital, um, means, well, to, to sum up in the case of Boston Medical Center, the, the model or the, um, the model of Boston Medical Center is uh, exceptional care without exception. And um, I think it's more than I've, in the 10 years that I've worked here, in a sense, it's, it's more, it's, you know, it's, 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 it sounds nice. Is it, is it, is it in practice real? In my experience, uh, more often than not, it is in practice real because um, I, I, just to, for an example, I had a case of a patient who came here um, from, um, she arrived here from a, a country in Africa, in Central Africa, and she, had an, she needed an operation and she could not afford it. She could not, she didn't have enough money for the operation to get it in the country where she was from. And she had no solution to, to that problem. I need an operation to save my life. I don't have enough money to, to get this operation done. So she um, happened to meet a travel agent in the country where she's from. And the travel agent said, you don't have enough money for the operation. Do you have enough money to buy a plane ticket to get from here to Boston, Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. And she said, I have enough money for the plane ticket. Okay, 
buy a one-way plane ticket from here to Boston. When you get to Logan Airport, find a way to get to Boston Medical Center. If you can get into the doors of that hospital, you will get your operation. Mm -hmm. That's just one example among many. I can cite many examples. Truck driver who had no health care in, in one of the states in the South needed an operation. This was before Obamacare. I've been here 10 years, so this was before Obamacare. Same thing. He, 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 he said he knew that if he could get to Boston, walk in the doors of this hospital, he will get the care he needs. Uh, uh, so you will find here people uh, catching a bus from Florida, getting off at South Station, which is not too far from here, about a mile away, walking here from South Station, getting into the doors of, of Boston Medical Center and being cared for. That's what a safety net hospital does. Yeah, and it and it's and and this is the mission and vision of safety net hospitals in the United States, primarily because we don't have rights-based approaches to health. Right, we have systems in place that prevent people from having consistent, affordable, appropriate, and accessible access to healthcare services all the time. And one of our challenges in our country and why safety net health hospitals have existed is be primarily because they provide care to populations that don't necessarily have consistent access to providers all the time, given how our healthcare system has been structured. And I'm thankful for places like BMC, Boston Medical Center, um, to ensure that people get the care that they need, especially in times of crisis. Crisis. And we see this over and over again at BMC. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about sort of this mission to provide um, care to the those who are disproportionately burdened by disease, morbidity, and mortality? I mean, it's part of, it's baked into the mission and vision of BMC. And as you said, I, you know, the people who are working at BMC are so dedicated to ensuring that um, the best health outcomes can be achieved when people walk Walk through those doors. What does what is the role of spiritual care in this institution? Um, and can you just tell us a little bit how it's structured at Boston Medical Center so that we can have a better sense of how spiritual care provision is generally delivered at safety net hospitals overall? Well, the um, th thank you for that question. And uh, just to, um, to kind of add add some flesh to what I shared earlier too about Boston Medical Center. So you're talking about a hospital, if you can imagine, where 40% of admissions, 40% uh, of all of our all of our missions here at, at Boston Medical Center are black uh, or African American uh, uh, patients, 40%. 80% of admissions here are people of color. 80% mm -hmm. people of color, 40% African-American or African. Um, and so historically, historically, at a hospital like this, when I started here uh, in 2011, we basically had two full-time staff chaplains. That means uh, staff chaplains who are interfaith, see all patients of all faiths, who are trained to work in a teaching hospital like Boston Medical Center. Two staff chaplains covering this hospital 24 seven. And that's phenomenal. It's just a remarkable statistic, Sam, because when I think about how large BMC is, this is an over 500 bed hospital. And we only, there are only two full-time staff chaplains that provide spiritual care for that population. Do you, is there, I mean, I'm just curious from your point of view, I mean, this is part of what, uh, what I always feel confronted by when I think about spiritual care provision at safety net hospitals. It's remarkable to me that the size of an institution, the scale of this institution that's serving 
right? Populations that are disproportionately affected by disease morbidity and mortality that presenting in not only the emergency rooms, but in inpatient, outpatient ambulatory that are consistently experiencing, right? The violence of our culture and society, right? And it manifests in these downstream presentations of disease morbidity and mortality, whether it's chronic diseases or they've been experiencing direct violence, that in a hospital of this size, given the mission and vision of this hospital, given the populations this hospital serves, that only two full-time staff chaplains are available to that population, let alone, right, the other challenges of that, that, that chaplains and safety net providers do is that they're not just treating patients, they're not just attending to the patient's family and social networks, but they're also attending to the needs of providers at the hospital, right? The, the providers, the staff, the integrated care teams that are attending to and addressing these issues and challenges. To me, this just seems so out of whack or it, it's, it is not in line with, with the amount of, of, of spiritual care providers I would imagine at a place like this. I would imagine that at least a team of 12 spiritual care providers would be needed to substantially support right, any kind of spiritual care provision at this hospital. I mean, I'm just curious from your perspective what you think about that. I mean, it, you've been living this and wrestling with this. And in a way, this is what Walter Wink is talking about. That is, this exists within a domination system, right, that almost is set up to perpetuate and reinforce these structures of violence. And I'm just curious if just alone, just this idea that there's only two full-time chaplains, spiritual care providers, in a hospital of over 500 beds with a community that's experiencing such profound um, uh, experiences with violence that this is the state of spiritual care in our safety net hospitals. And I'm just curious your, your, your perspective on that, Sam. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just as you were talking, Fernando, I mean, I, I, I um, you know, Boston Medical Center is not alone in the challenge that we face here in spiritual care. I mean, a few years ago, I was I got received a phone call from um, the director of chaplaincy services in, at, at I think it's Hennepin Hospital uh, in Minneapolis. And he was calling me to say, you know, they're going to they're going to cut. I have six chaplains. It's, it's, it's the safety net hospital for Minneapolis. It's the Boston Medical Center for Minneapolis. And he said, they're going to cut us from six chaplains to three. And I'm doing a survey. I'm calling other safety net hospitals to ask, you know, what's what level of staffing they have? Because if I find out that other other safety net hospitals have better staffing, you know, then I can make my case to, yeah. <laughs> to my yeah. my leadership that we should keep you shouldn't cut us. And I said to him, I'm not, what I'm going to tell you is not going to help you because there are, we have two and you shouldn't go back and tell your leadership. Well, Boston Medical Center has only two. It's not going to help your case. So right. I know this is happening with other safety net hospitals. I got another call similar to that. And when I said, you know, we're in bad shape, I can't help you. We're only two. And, and, uh, and she said, oh, I, in my survey, I found that San Francisco General only has one. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's across the board that this yeah. is a problem. And it's and not necessarily that our hospital administrators don't want spiritual care. Repeatedly, I hear from uh, all these hospital administrators at safety net hospitals that there is, they, they really want to keep and maintain a spiritual care team. But given the financial constraints of maintaining a full spiritual care team at a safety net hospital, it's almost impossible to maintain that. You know, it's just this idea that, wow, what happens to how does a hospital system that's already financially struggling because the reimbursements are so much tied to this pay for performance system that's set up in our healthcare system, that in order to draw down on any monies that are being reimbursed to the hospital, right, that has to be affiliated and attached to a particular ICD, you know, code, right, that associates that code with, right, a particular reimbursement for that hospital. And 
in, a, in my knowledge, that spiritual care is not part of this reimbursement system, right? It's not part it's not. of, like your, when you go see a patient and you provide spiritual care to that patient who is either dying or is in crisis or is experiencing bad news from a, a, an extremely difficult diagnosis, right? That, that, that provision of care is not covered. It's right? not. Is that right, it's Sam? Not. Nope. We can't, we don't, we are not, we're not, we're not a revenue stream. Is, I think that's the, the, the term. Yeah. Or revenue point. Uh, we don't, we can't bill for that. Exactly. And because, that, that creates this real, almost a scarcity model in spiritual care at safety net hospitals overall, right? What, that, what, what, what hospital administrators wrestle with on the bottom line. Oh, can I keep these six spiritual care providers? I can't because I just don't have the revenue to cover all six full-time equivalents, right? Full-time staff positions. And therefore I have to think about critically reducing that number down, right? Yes. And this is where, you know, you know, here I feel like, you know, like you and your colleagues who are at Boston Medical Center providing spiritual care all on the front lines, especially after all of what we're having to experience with the pandemic, right, that we're still wrestling with. And to think that even during these challenges, trying to find meaning in the pandemic, trying to support frontline healthcare workers who are experiencing, right, compassion fatigue, exhaustion, that they're leaving in droves, right? Right? just because they're so overwhelmed and exhausted from having to provide care during this pandemic. You know, this is where we are at a, at a crossroads in a lot of ways, is of recognizing that we do have dedicated spiritual care providers. We do have administrators that want to keep spiritual care at the hospitals, but there's no way to cover the costs of this spiritual care provision, right? And that that is where we're at within these, these safety net landscapes, is that something that is at, that is so important and significant to everyday people, right? That I come to the hospital and then I'm presenting with a real challenge and then I'm trying to ask why, right? If I have a God or if I don't have a God, just finding that meaning, you know, in that space of deep crisis or if I'm caring for a patient and I'm exhausted because this is like my 10th patient with the same presentation and I'm, I'm going to a spiritual care provider like you, Sam, and going, oh my gosh, I don't understand why this continues to be presenting before me. I'm exhausted, Sam, right? And if you're the only one at this hospital and there are literally hundreds of us coming to you, asking you, please help us, right? This is not sustainable, is it, Sam? I would say it's not, you know, and I, it, it, you're right, exactly. It's not sustainable. I mean, the term that I hear a lot, especially, I mean, way before the pandemic, you know, uh, way before the pandemic, there was the, the idea of moral injury. A lot of nurses, a lot of staff here would talk to me and use that term, moral injury. That was even before the pandemic. And so a um, couple of things, to, again, to put everything in context, uh, you know, because of Boston Medical Center being a safety net hospital, um, Victims of violence routinely are sent here. Gunshot wound cases routinely are uh, come here. So we're Boston Medical Center. I'm, I'm I'm originally from Los Angeles, and there's County USC. When I'm growing when I was growing up, you know, you always heard about when when there was uh, violence, especially gunshot violence, people would be taken to County USC. Well, that's Boston Medical Center is like the County USC or the Cook County uh, of, of Boston. Many victims of violence end up here, and um, and so and then we had the opioid crisis. So you're already here at, at at Boston Medical Center. You're having people come here because they've been victims of of, of violence, of gunshot, and then we have we're we're just feet yards away from what's called um, the methadone mile here in Boston, with the biggest, the largest concentrated area of of drug. Um, um, selling in the in in this in in the city, 
And so many, many, during the opioid crisis, many, many, many cases of, of, uh, of people who suffered from the opioid crisis uh, uh, problem bring, coming here. Uh, so before COVID, I was already tired. Yeah. <laughs> I was already exhausted. Yeah. Even more than that, you know, you know, the 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 cases of of uh, of uh, maternity um, infant mortality, especially in the in the African American community and communities of color, uh, during the time when Donald Trump was. Um, the Trump policy to separate families at the border. I just had this feeling that I, I felt this uptick, this, this, it just felt like, you know, I would see in a week, you know, instead of two cases of fetal demise uh, of a mother, you know, maybe 10, it just felt like all of a sudden it jumped up, the numbers jumped up of fetal demise I was seeing especially in uh, Latino undocumented immigrant women, you know, wondering, I think part of my theory then was, I wonder if mothers are thinking, maybe I shouldn't have this baby because if, if after I have this baby, that we're gonna be separated by this government, by the policies of this government. Well, Undoc this is the hospital of undocumented immigrants in Boston, the Boston area. If you don't have insurance, if you're undocumented, this is where you come. Exceptional care without exception. Mm. Something happens to you. When, so many times, many times patients come here because they haven't had access to health care. When they get here, it's too late. And the doctors will say, there's nothing medically we can do for you. The only thing we can do for you now is call the chaplain. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what was going on even before the pandemic. Right. And, and it is unsustainable. You're right. And, you know, I, I, this is where I, you know, Walter Wink, um, and I'm going to invite people who are listening to this to um, come into what Walter Wink writes in, in the chapter, Breaking the Spiral of Violence. That's on page 93 of The Powers That Be. Walter Wink writes, you know, when the violence comes, it's not a vengeful God that ushers it in, but we ourselves Right? The wrath uh, or judgment of God is precisely God's, quote unquote, giving us up to the consequences of our own violence. And this is where Walter Wink refers to Romans 1, 18.32 and Acts 7.42. But he co goes on to write, either we learn to stop the spiral of violence and scapegoating, or having been stripped of the scapegoating mechanism as an outlet for our violence, we will consume ourselves in an ap apocalypse of fire. You know, as you were talking, Sam, I feel that this, this, the system that you're, you're describing and what your experience at Boston Medical Center is this violence that we ourselves have ushered in, that this is not right, the violence that God, like this is not God's wrath upon us, but we as human beings, right, connected to these domination systems have set up almost, right, these structures of violence that everyday people are experiencing, that you're seeing present before you when you provide spiritual care, whether it's a fetal demise, right, or someone who's presenting at an emergency room because of a gunshot wound, or is experiencing another overdose from opioids, right? Mm -hmm. And is fighting for their lives. That we are, we need to learn how to stop the spiral of violence, right? Mm -hmm. And that we need to not only stop it, but get at the root of it, right? Mm -hmm. Get at the mm -hmm. root of this violence. So that spiral of violence that we're all caught up in, right, can actually break, that we break that cycle. You know, for me, it's not enough just to say, oh, Sam, you're, you know, what we need to do is just add 12 people to your team at Boston Medical Center, right? You know, I would argue that, yeah, that is a good start. We do need 12 more people at the spiritual care department at Boston Medical Center. But a deeper, deeper solution, right? A more transformative solution is how do we deal with 
you know, how do we deal with the root causes of why the hospital is seeing so many people presenting, right, at the safety net hospital with disease, morbidity, and mortality, with with the, with the outcomes of a violent, a violent society that we're living in, right, where we're all complicit in, right, the spiral of violence. You know, for me to strengthen our systems and what what Walter Wink invites us to do is that not only do we name and unmask fallen powers, right? But that we do the work of engaging with the fallen powers to redeem them. You know, the work that you're doing, Sam, as a spiritual care provider at Boston Medical Center is, is holy work, right? It's holy in that it's sacred, but it's holy because it's making in, it's making whole again, right? Um, what has been fallen, right? What has been broken? Um, it is wounded healers and attending to the wounded healers just as much as attending to the wounded, you know? And in this way, I'm curious from your point of view, like, this is where Walter Wink says, you know, our work is as, as, as agents for the sacred, right? Right, as agents of the holy, as actors of the holy, right, is not necessarily to react violently, but to approach this work nonviolently, to redeem the power so that we can make whole again these spaces that are so profoundly broken. You know, for me, the answer, part of the anecdote to support system strengthening of spiritual care providers at a place like Boston Medical Center is to think deeply about, well, what does this mean to provide spiritual care at a safety net hospital, right? You can add as many people as you want to this hospital, but it doesn't take away from the fact that People are presenting in the emergency rooms or in outpatient ambulatory clinics or in the inpatient, you know, intensive care units or other floors at that hospital with deep challenges that are part of, right, our own, our collective violence that we create to each other. You know, and I was just curious from your point of view, Sam, how we can work towards that nonviolently, how we can, how we're called and invited by what Wink says, right? This transformative power as a collective to shift and change the work that we do. And I'm thinking about this in terms of spiritual care. I'm always going, well, how can I be, you know, Sam, I've known you for a while now, right? And we've been part of, of this an amazing institution, Boston Medical Center, for all of its challenges. And there's still so much good that happens at this hospital that I'm so thankful that I'm part of, right? But I'm so frustrated. It makes me so angry that spiritual care is really struggling at this hospital let alone everything else, right? It gets me so angry that I'm like so mad to the point where I'm like, you know, it, it gets me to a place where Walter Wink is going, hey, Fernando, calm down. How do we approach this nonviolently? He's not saying, Walter Wink is not saying, and Jesus is not saying, and, and what we're reading in our sacred text, whether you're a Christian or not, whatever sacred text that is there, it's not calling us to arms, right? It's calling us, I believe God is calling us into a space of, yeah, we need to do this work to attend and address the challenges that spiritual care has at safety net hospitals. But is there a third way, Fernando, right? And that's where I'm curious from you, Sam. Like, I have witnessed you, I've witnessed your colleagues, I have been part of spiritual care teams over at Boston Medical Center, and I, there's so much of me that wants to give up, right? Because it's just so much, I just want to go away and be like, I'm not going to do this anymore. But in witnessing you, I am given a, a, a deep hope. It's not a joyous hope, but a dark, it's a dark hope, but it's hope nonetheless, that in this intractable space, Sam, that we can get through somehow and that that to me, when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, it's not to turn the other cheek and receive more violence, but it's to turn the other cheek to do the work nonviolently of finding a way through this intractable space. 
And I, I'm just curious from you, that, because we've been talking a lot about spiritual care and strengthening spiritual care systems. You know, when people are listening to us talk about this, you know, do you have a sense of how we can invite people into this work? They don't have to be spiritual care providers themselves, but how can they support, right, this work of spiritual care provision, how we can support people who are experiencing profound root cause issues that are tied to what is going on with the fallen powers? Well, that's a really good question, Fernando. And, um, you know, um, so I, you know, I've said that I've been here uh, more than 10 years as a, as a chaplain. Uh, but before, I don't know if I, if you remember this, Fernando, but before I came to Boston Medical Center, I actually didn't come here as a chaplain at another hospital. I had actually taken years off of my uh, training and professional uh, work as a, as a chaplain. I had taken many years off to be a community organizer, to work as a community organizer. And um, then, then it wasn't my intention to be uh, a chaplain here at Boston Medical Center. I was literally, you know, it was I was not looking for this job, but the person who who somebody met me and he he my predecessor here said you have to be the chaplain here. So I had to go by that. But as a community organizer, you know one of the things I learned, um, two books really spoke to me as a community organizer, and and maybe on this call there's going to be folks out there who are still out there doing that, that work. I'm not doing it because I'm here. I'm, I'm in this crisis situation, but I, I still apply. There, there are two books that really spoke to me when, when I was a community organizer. And one was, was um, a biography of, of uh, Ella Baker. Hmm. The other was the autobiography of Miles Horton, The Long hmm. Haul. Um, another book was um, one, one of the things that I, I think maybe was uh, attributed to Ella Baker, maybe not rightly, but you know, it, you may might have heard it. Organizing is slow, respectful work, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the other, the you know, with with Miles Horton, just the idea of the long haul. We're in this for the long haul, right? Mm -hmm. And so on a day, even like on a day like today, when I leave this call. You know, I, I will have already been paid several times today, and I, there's people I haven't seen yet today who need me. And when I leave this call, I've got to go see a bunch more people. And the thing is, is that um, the very next person I see after this call, I've still got to remember um, organizing is, is slow, respectful work. Spiritual care is slow, respectful work. If I hurry through my next visit, it's not going to, it's, it's, it's like taking two steps forward and two steps back. You don't make any progress. I've got to take the next visit slowly and respectfully, as slowly and respectfully as needed. And I know I may have four or five other people standing in line waiting to see me, but I can't rush. I just can't afford to rush because if I do, if I rush through the, my next my next call, the, the only person, the only thing that's going to be left, uh, the, the lingering idea that's going to be left in that patient's mind is, wow, God is in a hurry. God does not have time for my troubles. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I that's and that's the thing is, you know, that's the nonviolent way to approach this. I mean, the problem in healthcare is that because it's so profit driven, even at nonprofit hospitals, because uh, healthcare in the United States is not is not a public, it's not treated as a public good, but a private place where you can make private profit. So everything is speeded up. It's all about doing things quickly and fast and numbers, piling up the numbers. And that's very violent. It's violent. And even today, you know, even people. I, I hear a lot of people coming into the hospital, even at the hospitals that are that are not safety net. They say, I feel like I'm treated like a number. 
-hmm. There's so much violence in our healthcare system because of the profit motive. Mm -hmm. And and can spiritual care can with chaplains? What would you be giving up if we went to that and said, "Oh, well, I'm supposed to be here to see the pile up the numbers and say how many people can I see today?" Right. Right. You know, if if you do it slowly and respectfully. You know, I had this problem when I was in, in community organizing because you would get grants from foundations yeah. and, and you have to report on the grant. They said, well, you would have to knock on how many doors in a day? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I used to tell the staff that I worked with then in community organizing, even then I said, well, that's one way to do it. But Ella Baker said, you know, organizing is slow, respectful work. That's the nonviolent way to do it. And I do believe that is what, what Dr. Wing talked about in Jesus is the third way. The third way, right? The third way is, is the way through in the sense that, that we have to be radically present and radically curious with our radical hospitality, right, to move forward. Right. The invitation to this work and this realm is that there is a long haul to it. Right. That we need to be consistently in process. Right. And that process is not always perfect. Right. That we need to work towards these solutions, knowing that we may not even see them happen. Right. That we may not actually see them manifest in our lifetime but that we are doing the dedicated work, right? This divine call that Dr. Wing talks about in, earlier in this book was that there's a divine vocation that we're all called to do. We're taking that piece of the work, but we have to remember the whole, that we remember the integrated, right? Our integrated communities, that we all belong to each other in this space, that we all can work together to actualize and manifest a spiritual care at a safety net hospital well, that's not necessarily tied to money, right? That we can decolonize that wealth, that we can actually separate ourselves from a profit drivenness, even in a nonprofit space. That spiritual care at safety net hospitals and the solutions to spiritual care provision at safety net hospitals requires, right, a real long haul approach, the long view, right? And that the work that we do now is working towards Toward, right, the liberation of us all in the space of the fallen powers. So I appreciate those two lessons, that lesson, the lessons from both of those in your organization, organizing years, but also what you've taught me even as, a, as the head of spiritual care at, say, at, at, at Boston Medical Center is that, Fernando, hey, like, wait, yeah, you want to change this, but this is not going to happen overnight. And that even though people appreciate spiritual care, and even though we are at the front lines really exhausted in providing spiritual care, we also recognize that what feeds us and nourishes us, that keeps us safe and sound in this space, is that, that there are a lot of us are trying to work together to actually transform this system, transform these structures of violence, and trying to redeem the fallen powers. So I really appreciate those lessons, Sam, and I appreciate those insights, um, especially since we're talking in a community of practice that is seeking ways to support, you know, you know, safety net spiritual care strengthening, right? How do we do that? And that, yeah, it is going to take us a while, but if we connect together and remember that work, right, and remember how we organize our, amongst ourselves, to attend to and address the violence that we witness in our culture and society, we will do right that liberatory work of mm -hmm. redeeming the powers. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Sam. Absolutely, absolutely. Sam, I know we've been talking for a while. I, you know, I just want to add: Are there anything? Is there anything else that you want to say that that we've been discussing about sort of the powers that be in relationship to spiritual care provision at, at safety net hospitals? Is there anything that you want to tell our communities about um, sort of spirit, spiritual care provision um, at a place like BMC, based on your experience and your wisdom? Well, Fernando, you know, you you earlier you mentioned the word wounded healer, and um, you know, oftentimes people ask me, you know, how do you how do you how do you do it? I mean, it's so exhausting. Yet I, I I get here, you know, every day and 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 do do the, you know do my job. 
Um, and um, the um, um, that idea of the wounded healer is actually um, st strengthening in a way. And I'll just say this. So yesterday, um, I seem to be, yesterday I was here and getting a lot of calls from patients because, you know, the, they would say to me, well, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I wanted to see a chaplain here at the hospital because today's Sunday and I'm not in church and I'm missing being in church. And then, you know, I dig a little bit and what people are really worried about is because there's a war and it's off and, and, and we don't know what's going to happen because there's a war going on and they're, and they're, and they can't avoid it. It's on the television. It's everywhere. And they're not, so there's a war in their bodies because they're here in the hospital, but there's a war outside of the hospital that they're worried about what's going to happen now with this war going on. And it, it reminded me uh, about the wounded healer um, that um, everything that's happening to the people of Ukraine right now, yeah. uh, my mother actually went through it. Yes. And she, she was living in Hong Kong, December 7th, 1941. Here in this country, we remember it as day of Pearl Harbor. But yeah. that day, my mother was a, was a student uh, 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 teach, at a teacher's college in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong was invaded and occupied. And she had to leave the city because there was no food. Yeah. She had to get home, you know, to her, to her home in, in rural China, walk 200 miles, 18 days walking. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, that's part of my, uh, um, the trauma of my family's history. We, we, we know what it's like to be displaced, what war is like. Mm. And I, I always go back to that reservoir, the wounded healer, that gives me the strength, the motivation to keep coming back here and being with folks who've come up uh, from Haiti through the Darien Gap to the border to get across. They get to Boston Medical Center. These are the people that I see here, but that's part of my history, too. That's part of my background, too. Absolutely. And Sam, I really uh, thank you for sharing that. And I really appreciate how you've lifted up um, the wounded healer. I love how Henry Nowen in The Wounded Healer has written about this in, in relationship to compassion, right? And how, how that can be part of this way through, right? I, I think Henry Nowen is quoted as saying through, if I get this quote correct, through compassion, it's possible to recognize that the craving for love that people feel resides in our own hearts and that the cruelty of the world knows all too well is also rooted in our own impulses. Nowen writes that or says that through compassion, we also sense our hope for forgiveness in our friends' eyes and our hatred in their bitter mouths. When they kill, we know that we could have done it. When they give life, we know that we can do the same. For a compassionate person, nothing human is alien. No joy, no sorrow, no way of living, and no way of dying. You know, for me, now and really captures this human condition, you know, and that we have a deep capacity as wounded healers to hold profound compassion in deep places of crisis, right? In profound witnessing of violence, in the sheer violence of the fallen powers upon us. But that in that space, you know, that call to the third way that Walter Wing talks about is towards that transformation that even within our woundedness, even within, within our woundedness, we have the, capa the capacity to heal. 
and as wounded healers, right? That is the breath of our life, right? And that mm-hmm. in that breath of life, we can continue to engage with each other and understand our belongingness to each other. This is our work, right, Sam? This mm-hmm. is why we'll mm-hmm. never give up on Boston Medical Center's real, you know, mission and vision, right? Mm-hmm. That is consistently animated each and every day, even through the tiredness of being there, right? The absolute utter overwhelmedness of witnessing such profound and sheer violence that through that, even through that, right? I know there's another wounded healer that's there in you and in others that are serving, right? And that are called in their divine vocation to be present at Boston Medical Center. So Sam, thank you for that lesson and thank you for your words and actually also your faith, right? And your faith in this process, this long haul process process, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of engaging with this work, right? This is not easy work. I don't think, I don't think, you know, anything that's connected to the fallen powers and the redemption of the fallen powers is easy work, right, Sam? Mm -hmm. This is the Mm -hmm. work that, that I'm thankful we're called to and that we lean into and that we support each other through. Um, Even if the times are dark, there is always light, right? And that Mm -hmm. in that light, we can continue, even if it's a glimmer of light, that we can hold on to each other in this space. So thank you for that, Sam. And I appreciate all that you do uh, at Boston Medical Center and all of the people you serve at BMC, whether it's patients, their families, or our very dedicated providers um, at the Safety Net Institution. Thank you, Sam, for this time. And I appreciate you being part of this conversation uh, around the powers that be and Dr. Walter Wink's work, as well as the work that we are continuing to do at strengthening spiritual care at Safety Net Hospitals. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Blessings to you, okay? Blessings. Thank you. Thank you.